All right, good morning. I'm Pastor Gillespie from St. John Evangelical Lutheran Church and School, Sherman Center, Random Lake, Wisconsin. It's good to have you with us here this morning for the Congregation of Prayer, a guide for daily meditation and prayer around God's Word. It's Monday, April 15th, 2024, and uh, yeah, it was a good weekend, and uh, lovely weather yesterday, of course, and a lovely day to be around God's Word. Um what was I going to say? Oh, the uh, the piece I was playing for you, I know it's a Christmas piece, but um, the composer shared it on his Facebook page. Um, John Benke is the composer um, and had some lovely comments about it. Let's see if I can find it here. Uh, recent, did he create it? Uh, oh, don't know where, don't know where I saved it. I thought I saved it in my photo album. Oh yeah, here we go. Uh, sort by date. Let's see what he had to say about the recording, which I did. <laughs> so that's why I was I was pleased. Oh, uh, of course, it's not synced. There it is. He wrote, um, uh, please listen to the wonderful recording of this piece all the way to the marvelous end. It's spectacular. All right. So yeah, it was good to get that compliment. So I can share it with you here too. You get to hear some of that work that I do for the church. Today, our catechesis is going to resume actually where we left off probably back in November, maybe October, which was, um, if you remember, the calling of Samuel to be priest in place of Eli, and then uh, the capture of the Ark of the Covenant when it, when Israel went out to war without God's approval. All right, captured by the Philistines. Of course, God's going to also use that to bring judgment against the Philistines, and that's what we'll hear today. This is in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 5. All right. Yesterday was Good Shepherd Sunday, so it's Good Shepherd Week, we'll say. Uh, and that you'll hear in the themes of, of our psalm, especially. Let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our psalm this week is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. All right, our verse for the week is from Romans chapter 8. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, verse 28. All right, and then uh, last week we had God's instruction to the government as to what their role and responsibility is. That was in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through, uh, 1 through 4. All right, and that is to punish wrongdoers and to commend those who do well. Um. That's the, that's the government as it's been tasked by God, the civil government, we might say. And now of citizens, um, uh, what does God give us to do? And um, I think we all have a little bit of a rebel in us, I suppose. It, it, it may be a cultural thing, being Americans, I mean, founded and not that long ago um, through uh, rebellion against authority. Um, think of, um, well, it was King George, right, in the and the Revolutionary War, um, I think there are some serious questions as to whether that was a just rebellion, actually. Now, it's hard to go back and 
um, second guess the motivations of the people then. And we can thank God for the country that we have and that we've maintained a, um, a healthy relationship uh, with England uh, more recently, especially through world wars. But um, regardless, <laughs> um, was, it, was it a just rebellion you know, over taxation or lack of representation in the, in the, uh, the houses of parliament or whatever? Uh, this remains to be seen. And uh, the, the question is, of course, if that was an unjust, or if that was a just rebellion, then why could we not rebel against our current government, which the taxation rate is 10x what it was at the time of the Revolutionary War. We're even, we even have less representation today, both at a state level and at a federal level than we did then. Um, and we certainly have less freedoms as well. Um, not on paper, but but in practice. Um, so, um, well, why why could we not now? Well, there's a movie out just came out called Civil War. So, <laughs> ask that question. I, I assume I don't know. I haven't seen it. Um, as Christians, we actually step back and uh, more or less different Christians at different times have had different opinions about this. Um, even myself probably, but um, we step back and we uh, we recognize that. Rebellion against civil authority is a, is a lower thing, um, and that the higher calling is to be citizens of the kingdom of heaven, to be a rural subjects under Christ our King, right, our Good Shepherd King, as you heard yesterday. And uh, whatever the civil rule is, yes, it's never up to the standard of God's kingdom, um, but of course, it's of this world, and it's um, and it's ruled, of course, by this world's uh, prince, which is um, Satan himself. So. Uh, to expect civil government to represent godly government is, uh, well, it's a fool's errand, all right? Um, and so, generally speaking, what Christians are, not necessarily pacifist, I, I think that would be a false presentation, but um, but generally we try to live at peace with one another um, so that we may focus our attention on um, the needs of our family, but also, but importantly, the needs of the Christian family, that is the Christian congregation, all right? Um, you might put it this way. Um, our goal for government is to be as least invasive as possible, um, um, and so that we can work actively for that, but that if we focus all of our attention upon civil government, we lose sight of the thing that actually matters, which is the government of Christ. All right? That would be his church and the gifts that he gives us in his church. So maybe this would be a good suggestion. Turn off um, Fox News or CNN or CNN, CNBC or MSNBC or whatever whatever you're watching or you have on television or on the radio all day, um, and instead um, gather with Christians to hear God's word and let that order your days um, in Christ's peace rather than in the false peace that this world gives. That would be my suggestion to you. Um, having dabbled into political machinations and trying to figure out what's going on there and other kinds of worldly things. Um, hmm. Generally, nothing actually improves, and um, I think it's distracting from the thing needful, which is Jesus. All right, so table of duty of citizens. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. Matthew 22, verse 21. That was related to the coin, if you remember, right? It is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is why this is also why you pay taxes, April 15th, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Romans 13, verses 5 through 7. It was not intentional that I chose uh, these readings for this day, but uh, there you are. So uh, today is the day where the Infernal Revenue Service uh, demands their due. <laughs> Um, I don't, they don't really collect revenue. I, I don't think. How do you define revenue?
All right. Sorry about that. I continue to lose audio. Um, I don't know what's going on. I did some uh, questions with folks, but uh, nobody had any answers as to what's going on here. All right. Um, where were we? Romans 13. Continuing then, um, I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may lead or live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior. 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 3. All right. Um, Next verse. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good. Titus 3, verse 1. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. 1 Peter 2, verses 13 through 14. Okay. So, yeah, not intentional that uh, we would have those readings for today, but as citizens, our goal is to live at peace uh, with one another and uh, at peace with our government. Um, the question is, when does the government become tyrannical and ungodly? Um, that's a different question than what uh, the scriptures are giving us to ask. And whether God would give us to overthrow government is a whole other question. Um, but uh, that would be the exception, not the rule. All right. Our first reading today is from Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 19. This should sound familiar to you. We heard this yesterday. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross. And you, who once were alienated and enemies, in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which has been given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. All right. So, uh, we, yeah, we've been studying Colossians. We haven't really gotten this far. Um, you'll note this will be probably the context of what we'll study this coming Sunday, namely that uh, for us to receive Christ Jesus, we must have a preacher or a minister who delivers the riches of Christ to us. Um, it is true that God is in the heavens and God works in all things, but by working in all things, we must recognize that there are particular ways that he has appointed um, to work for our good and to, and to deliver even himself to us. And that uh, one of those ways is, of course, the office of the holy ministry, which he has instituted and which we read of right here. All right. And then our reading for catechesis is from 1 Samuel chapter 5. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought, brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was Dagon, fallen on its face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set it in its place again. And when they arose early the next morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face um, to the ground before the ark of the Lord. The head of Dagon and both the palms and its hands were broken off um, on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso was left in of it. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any who come into Dagon's house tread on it 
are tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this day. But the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod, and he ravaged them and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. And when the men of Ashdod saw how it was, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is harsh toward us and Dagon our God. Therefore they sent and gathered to themselves all the lords of the Philistines and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be carried away to Gath. So they carried the ark of the God of Israel away. And so it was that after they had carried it away, that the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he struck the men of the city, both small and great, and tumors broke out on them. Therefore they sent the ark of the God to Akron, of God to Akron. And so it was as the ark of God came to Akron that the Akronites cried out, saying, They have brought the ark of God of, the God of Israel to us, to kill us and our people. And so they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it go back to its own place, so that it does not kill us and our people. For there was a great deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. And the men who did not die were stricken with tumors, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. Now the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. All right. So, uh, what did the Philistines do with the ark? Remember, it had been stolen, um, but God had allowed it to allowed it to be stolen because uh, back in chapter four, um, Israel had forgotten who their rock of help was, and um, they tried to use the ark in ways that God had not intended. And when you try to use God's gifts in ways that He does not intend, they become a curse to you. Right? Do you think of the sacrament of the altar receiving it outside of faith? Actually, you receive it into your hurt and harm. Same thing with using the ark and going to war um, outside of God's command. All right? And so now the Philistines have it. Um, they go and place it, of course, in their temple, the temple of Dagon. Dagon uh, would have a human head and torso and hands and arms, um, but have uh, a fish fish for legs. So uh, we would call this guy a merman, I guess. A merman. Uh, he's like, uh, what's his name? Uh, the Marvel character. Anyway, uh, what did the people of Ashdod then discover in the morning, the first morning? Dagon, there's the big statue, had fallen over. So, of course, they put it back up. Oh, it's just an accident, right? Uh-huh. And then the next day, what happens? The same thing, except this time, um, its head and its hands were broken off and were lying on the threshold, the step, right? Or the, maybe the entrance. Only his body remained. Of course, the head and the hands. The head is the uh, is the uh, the director, if you like, of the body. Without the head, there can be no body. Christ is the head of our body, the church. We heard that from um, from Colossians, right? And so, without the head, um, there can be no life for the body. Um, also, um, the crushing of the serpent's head might be in line in mind here, or, and also. Um, the decapitation of uh, the great Philistine champion, Goliath, later on, right? And there's only one head by whom all creation gets its life, breath, and meaning. That's Jesus. Hands were broken because life, of course, comes from the hands. The hands bring work, and um, and the, the hands are what give. So uh, with no hands, then uh, Dagon, of course, cannot serve. Of course, later we find out the hand of the Lord was heavy upon the people of Ashdod, Right? So it's the Lord who's really behind what's happening and was heavy upon them. So now the priests of Dagon apparently no longer step on the threshold. <laughs> they step over the threshold. Well, that's nice piety, I suppose. What did the Lord do to Ashdod? Yeah, he brought devastation on the Philistines um, and struck them with tumors. Um, by the way, if you read this in the Old King James, it's not tumors, but it's hemorrhoids which is interesting. <laughs> I uh, found an article about this and like, well, how did they end up with hemorrhoids from tumors? Um, now there's a whole textual tradition there that you can, you can read about if you want. Um, yeah. So then the men of he um, Ashdod recognized that the hand of the Lord is heavy on them. And so then they, uh, and the Lord was punishing them. So they moved the ark to Gath. What happens to the people of Gath? 
He afflicts the city there. They also break out with the tumors. Now they want the ark out of their city, so where do they send it? To Akron. This is like a game of hot potato here. They send the ark away. Um, but the people of Akron, of course, are struck with the deadly destruction and the tumors as well. And uh, they um, ask why the ark has been brought to them to kill them. This is three of the five um, three of the five Philistine cities. Um, the other two would be Gaza and Ashkelon. All right. So um, Gaza and Ashkelon were already involved, I think, back in chapter four. So we, we actually find this plague coming against all the cities of the Philistines, all the capital cities. Those who are not died are the ones um, who cried out for mercy about the heavy blow that the Lord has struck against them. And so this whole hot potato scene is about seven months, it says here, right? From when it was first captured to when they're finally going to get rid of it. And we'll hear about that tomorrow. Looks like most of you have found your way back over to the video. I'm sorry, I have to restart the uh, streaming software in order to get my audio back. Um, gonna have to, I'm going to have to figure out a better solution than that because then uh, you all have to figure out where I am. I think on YouTube it just kind of re... If you just stay on the same page. I don't know if it comes back or not. Um, or Facebook. So maybe on the other platforms like Rumble or um, um, Odyssey. I think those platforms actually... Just You just kind of go to a pause screen for a bit until I come back. All right, so let's summarize what we just read. The Philistines foolishly boasted that their God had triumphed over the God of Israel. The Philistine victory did not come from the hand of their God, but from the hand of the Lord. Thus, the statue of Dagon was found face down like all the dead gods of men. The head was broken off because there was only one head of all creation through whom all life comes. The hands were broken because Dagon was powerless and had no life to give from his own hands. The hand of the Lord was heavy upon the Philistines until they finally realized that the ark was the place where the Lord, the only true God, was present according to his word. The Philistine gods, like the, all the gods of men, could not give them life, and so their cities were filled with death. All right. Good. Our hymn for this week uh, is a lovely Easter hymn from uh, George Vetter, Georg Vetter, probably. Um, oh, we have Vetters in our congregation, don't we? Yeah, we do. Um, and then uh, translated by Martin Franzman from uh, Concordia St. Louis back in the day. Uh, it was first published in the hymnal supplement in 1969 in English for us. So uh, relatively recent, 1969, so 70, 50, just 50 years ago that we've had it in English um, so it's worth our learning here. So we've sung it a few times this season already. All right. Looks like maybe. There you go.
Let us pray. O God, through the humiliation of your Son, you raised up the fallen world. Grant to your faithful people, rescued from the peril of everlasting death, perpetual gladness and eternal joys. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We pray, merciful Father, grant us faith to pray for the civil authorities and to trust that you will accomplish your good and gracious will through them. Teach us to live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness, and to be ready to do whatever is good in service to others in our community and nation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray this day for faith to live in the promises of holy baptism, for all vocations and daily work, for the unemployed, for the salvation and well-being of our neighbors, for our schools, our homeschools, our colleges and seminaries, and for good government and peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray with Alan and Jackie, who celebrated their birthday yesterday, with Teresa, Anne, and Sandy, all celebrating their baptism or their birthday today. We pray for the households of our church, especially this week, with Don and Jean, Chad and Mindy, Dick, Julie, Angie, and Matt and Allie. Pray for our catechumens. We pray for those ill receiving treatment or recovering, especially Ralph, Allison, Maria, Joe, Dennis, Brad, and Billy Joe, Harriet, Ron, uh, um, Carol, Mike, Doug, Ruth, Renata, Joan, Sandy, BJ, President Willie, and Phil. We pray for our homebound, Dan, Lenore, Joan, Paul, Dolores, and Pauline. Pray for the missions and mercy work of the church, especially that of Lutheran Heritage Foundation. And we continue to pray for the work of church planting in the South Wisconsin District. For all this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Continue to pray for those who grieve, especially um, the family and friends of Merlin and of Dick. Again, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. All right, that's our congregation of prayer for today, Monday, April 15th, 2024. Sorry for the uh, glitch in the stream again. I will uh, try to prevent that from happening again. I've been talking to the uh, various software people. Uh, Nobody quite seems to know what it is, and I haven't found anybody else who has the same problem. So uh, chasing bugs like that are somewhat tricky, but uh, we'll get it under control. God be with you all, and keep you safe, and I hope to see you again in the morning. We thank you for listening to this podcast from St. John Evangelical Lutheran Church Sherman Center in Random Lake, Wisconsin. If this podcast is of benefit to you, please consider supporting the work of St. John by visiting stjohnrandomlake.org, that's stjohnrandomlake.org, slash support, and give today.